Get ready to gain a one-way ticket to the most dangerous world humanity has ever faced. Forget everything you know about safety, about being at the top of the food chain. Now travel back in time with me, not to the age of dinosaurs, to a time far more recent and far more terrifying, 200,000 years ago. In that world, humanity was a newborn species, a fragile spark on a planet of monsters. We weren't the masters of the world, we were the prey. Every single day was a battle for survival on a planet that seemed to be actively trying to wipe us from existence. This is the story of how we survived hell. The story of how we became us. If this journey into our most brutal and perilous past has already sparked your curiosity, then strengthen our expedition from the start. Leave a like to help us reach more explorers, and subscribe to Extinct Doc now so you don't miss a single detail of what comes next. 200,000 years ago, Earth was a very different place, a world of violent extremes. The planet was immersed in what scientists call Marine Isotope Stage 6, a particularly severe glacial period within the Pleistocene. Ice sheets kilometers thick covered much of the northern hemisphere, but Africa, our cradle, faced its own battles. It was not the stable landscape we imagine. It was a brutal climatic carousel with fluctuations that could change dramatically within a few generations. Studies of ice cores and marine sediments show that the climate oscillated violently between mega droughts that turned savannas into deserts for millennia and green wet periods known as African humid periods that transformed the Sahara into a landscape of rivers and lakes. These changes forced populations to migrate, adapt or die. And most importantly, we were not alone. The planet was a mosaic of different types of humans, most of them older, physically stronger, and better adapted to their environments than we were. In Europe and Western Asia, the Neanderthals reigned, masters of the Ice Age, powerful hunters with robust bodies, wide noses to warm the cold air, and enormous brains, perfectly adapted for life on the frozen steppes. In Eastern Asia, the enigmatic Denisovans thrived, a ghost lineage we know only from genetic fragments. And in Indonesia, late populations of Homo erectus may have still roamed. And us, Homo sapiens, we were evolution's new bet. A recently emerged anatomically modern species, confined primarily to Eastern and Southern Africa. We were the underdogs. But what were we like 200,000 years ago? The fossils from this era paint a fascinating portrait. The Omo Kibish skulls from Ethiopia, dated to around 195,000 years ago by researchers like Richard Leakey, already show unmistakably sapiens features, like a prominent chin and a high cranial vault. But the even older fossils from Jebel Irhud, Morocco, dated to 300,000 years ago by a team led by Jean-Jacques Hublin of the Max Planck Institute, show an even more primitive phase. They had a modern face, but their brain case was longer and lower, more archaic. This tells us something crucial. Our bodies, slender and long-legged, adapted for dissipating heat and for walking and running long distances, were already basically formed. Our brain was already the same size as it is today, about 1,400 cubic centimeters, but its wiring and even its shape were in flux. As Hublin himself describes, our brain reached its modern size first, and only then, over the next 100,000 years, did it undergo a phase of globalization, becoming rounder. This process is linked to the expanded development of the cerebellum and the parietal lobes, areas crucial for complex thought, language, working memory, and symbolism. 
We were a work in progress, a version 1.0 of humanity thrown into one of the most brutal environments in the planet's history. The Africa of the Middle Pleistocene was no photo safari. It was a battlefield. Competition was fierce, and the competitors were giants. The savanna floor was patrolled by predators that would make today's lions look like kittens. There was Machiradus, a lion-sized saber-toothed cat, a master of ambush designed to take down large prey with a single precise bite to the neck. There were giant hyenas like Paki Krakuda that weighed over 100 kilos and had a bite with bone-crushing force that could annihilate any carcass. Competing with them for food was a suicidal activity. And the herbivores were no easy prey. They were walking fortresses. There was Sincaris Antiquus, an ancestral buffalo with horns that measured up to three meters from tip to tip a true horned tank. There were elephants and rhinos much larger than today's, like Peleoxodon yolans. Every animal was a mountain of muscle and survival instinct. Even the rivers and lakes concealed crocodiles of terrifying proportions, which saw any animal at the water's edge as a potential meal. In this scenario, a small group of Homo sapiens, weighing about 60 kilos and armed only with pieces of wood and stone, was an easy target. Physically, we were outmatched in every way. Strength, speed, claws, fangs, we had none of it. So how did we survive this hell? We didn't win through brute force. We won through intelligence. Imagine having to leave your cave every day knowing that these creatures are out there. Which of these monsters from prehistoric Africa would you be most afraid of encountering? The ambushing saber tooth or the giant crocodile in the river? Leave your opinion in the comments below. Our competitive advantage, the tool that allowed us to survive and eventually thrive, was inside our skulls. 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens was already operating with new mental software, and the proof is in the tools they left behind, a true technological revolution. This was the African Middle Stone Age, MSA, the tools were no longer the large, heavy hand axes of Homo erectus. Technology had become lighter, more modular, and above all, more intelligent. The hallmark of this era is the level law technique. Think about this. Before, to make a tool, you took a rock and chipped it until it had the shape you wanted. With level law, the process was abstract. The artisan would take a block of stone, the core, and meticulously prepare it, flaking its edges in a precise, premeditated sequence. They weren't making the tool yet, they were preparing the mold. The final goal was with a single, precise, well-placed strike to detach a perfect flake, already in the desired shape and size. This requires a level of planning, of future visualization, and abstract thought that was revolutionary. It was like a sculptor seeing the statue inside the block of marble. And they went even further. At sites like Pinnacle Point on the coast of South Africa, a team led by archaeologist Curtis Marion discovered something incredible. They found evidence that 164,000 years ago, humans were deliberately heat-treating stone. They would take a rock called silcrete, which isn't very good for flaking, and bury it under a fire, heating it slowly and controllably for hours. This process, called heat treatment, changes the rock's molecular structure, making it much easier to flake and producing incredibly sharp and durable blades. This is applied chemistry. It's a multi-step process that requires patience, knowledge transmission, and a deep understanding of cause and effect. But the biggest revolution wasn't just technological, it was symbolic. It's in this era that we see the first clear evidence that we were thinking about something beyond immediate survival. The use of ochre, a red mineral pigment, becomes common. It wasn't just used as paint. 
Analyses show it was used as a primitive sunscreen, as an insect repellent, and crucially, as an adhesive to attach spear points to wooden shafts. But it was also used to paint bodies, for rituals, to create social identity. It was the birth of culture. At sites like Blombos Cave, also in South Africa, the first jewelry was found. Small seashells deliberately perforated 75,000 years ago to be worn on a necklace or bracelet. This has nothing to do with survival. It has everything to do with identity, with aesthetics, with status. It has everything to do with being human. So what was life like for a small group of Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago? It was a nomadic existence, in small groups of maybe 20 to 30 individuals, an intimate and vital social network following the herds and the seasons. The foundation of their survival was cooperation. Hunting was a high-risk, high-reward activity, and it required sophisticated planning. They were master trackers, the evidence of lighter, sharper stone spear points suggests they no longer needed to get as close to their prey. They had developed projectiles. Instead of a heavy thrusting spear, they created lighter darts that could be thrown with greater accuracy and distance. They didn't hunt with the strength of a Neanderthal, who would confront a mammoth up close. They hunted with intelligence, using the terrain, traps, teamwork, and technology to bring down animals from a distance. Gathering plant and marine resources was equally important and likely led by the women of the group, who possessed an encyclopedic knowledge of plants, roots, and shellfish. On the South African coast, for example, they became masters of exploiting ocean resources. Analyses of shells found in the caves show that they knew exactly when and where to gather shellfish during low tides, a reliable and omega-3 rich food source, crucial for brain development. At night, life centered around the campfire. The fire was their fortress. It kept predators at bay, provided warmth and light, and was the center of their social life. It was around the fire that tools were made and repaired, Food was shared, a pillar of our social evolution that strengthens group bonds, and most importantly, stories were told. Knowledge was transmitted, hunting strategies, the locations of water, the properties of plants, alliances with other groups, all of this was stored not in books, but in the collective memory, reinforced by rituals and narratives. Life was short and brutal. Infant mortality was high sky. A broken leg or an infection could be a death sentence. But as we've seen with the Neanderthals, caring for the sick and injured was likely a crucial part of their survival strategy. An experienced individual, even if injured, was a repository of knowledge too valuable to be discarded. The community was their greatest weapon. They used their minds to create technology, symbols, and community. Of all these skills, the creation of advanced tools, the use of art and symbols, or strong social cooperation, which do you believe was the most decisive for our survival in that hostile world? 200,000 years ago, we were just one of evolution's many human experiments, a young and vulnerable species confined to a single continent. The planet was hostile and the odds were stacked against us. But in that forge of danger and adversity, we developed the tools that would allow us, tens of thousands of years later, not just to survive, but to inherit the Earth. We did not survive because we were the strongest, the fastest, or the most ferocious. We survived because we were the most adaptable, the most cooperative, and because we possessed a mind capable of imagining tomorrow and learning from yesterday. The brain you are using to understand this video was forged in fear and necessity around a campfire under a prehistoric sky. And if you want to gain more knowledge about this incredible journey and the lost worlds our ancestors inhabited, then you are in the right place. Continue this exploration with us. 
subscribe to Extinct Doc and hit the bell so you don't miss a single chapter of our past. Leave a like if this story changed your view of our earliest ancestors and share this video with everyone who loves to unravel the greatest secrets of our existence. Your interaction is the fuel that allows us to keep digging into the past. Thank you for watching and see you next time.